Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. And once again, thank you kindly for stopping by. I trust you all had a great weekend. It's certainly very wet and wintry here in Nairobi. Uh, if you haven't had a chance, do have a look at that presentation I made at the Deloitte uh, function uh, just over a week ago. About uh, the, the title of it was A View of the World, but it looked at the world, it looked at crude oil, it looked at geopolitics, Africa, and then Kenya finally. And uh, much more exciting than that, of course, was Dr. Christian Turner taking a spin in a Jaguar F-Type. Um, the number plate was 007. If you get a, if you get an opportunity, do have a look at that as well. What a fun! And I also did an interview with some folks uh, from Italy. Um, they represent a suit maker, bespoke tailor called Salvatore Di Francesca. And the fellow I was interviewing, extremely charismatic gentleman and a friend, and do have a look at that if you get a chance. It was a pleasure catching up with Ashish Thaka yesterday at the Kabinsky, and on the same day that Javier Blas issued his uh, Monday uh, 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 article um, saying Ashish Thaka, Bob Diamond's African partner. And, uh, that link is on Rich Wrap Ups. We attended uh, the farewell party for Bart and Kareen Ouvry, and I took uh, a photograph there, and they've been very good friends. Uh, he's the Belgium ambassador, and he's now headed back to Brussels. And then finally, I was dropping off my daughter on the outskirts of Nairobi on Sunday afternoon, and I took this photograph, and I called it the afternoon from the outskirts of Nairobi. Political Reflections, BBC World, U.S. unfreezes $575 million in military aid to Egypt as the Secretary of State John Kerry visits Cairo and uh, that was predictable. Uh, Sisi was very clever to, um, to uh, speak to um, uh, the situation in the Sinai in particular, the combating terrorism. I think that played into the narrative and uh, I for one was expecting this decision. Um, the U.S. is seeking an Iraq under its hegemony and ruled by its stooges, said Ayatollah Khamenei. We are strongly opposed to the U.S. and other intervention in Iraq. We don't approve of it as we believe the Iraqi government, nation and religious authorities are capable of ending the sedition. Uh, the main dispute in Iraq is between those who want Iraq to join the U.S. camp and those who seek an independent Iraq. Khamenei again. The U.S. aims to bring its own blind followers to power. Um, and uh, clearly that's a situation which I'd been expecting him to speak out on because now you've got the U.S. essentially parked practically all around Iran and throwing more people into the Iraqi situation is going to further encircle Iran, I think. Fighters from the Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant uh, took all the border crossings with Jordan and Syria. This is uh, Hamid, uh, Hamid Ahmed Hashim, a member of the Anbar Provincial Council, said by telephone yesterday. Obama told CBS in an interview that will be aired in full today that the fighting could spread to allies like Jordan. The militants are engaged in wars in Syria where in that vacuum that's been created, they could amass more arms, more resources, the president said. The possibility of an Iraqi government without Maliki gained credibility when the country's top cleric, Grand Ayatollah Ali al-Sistani, last week called for an effective government that can avoid previous mistakes. Um, it's not the place for the United States to choose Iraq's leaders, Obama said. It is clear, though, that only leaders that can govern with an inclusive agenda are going to be able to truly bring the Iraqi people together and help them through this crisis. It's clearly very fluid. ISIS, in my view, is an intelligence asset and funded largely by um, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait and the GCC. And therefore, it's very difficult for President Obama to go against ISIS in a convincing manner, given that background that we know about. Apparently, they've been hijacking hashtags for propaganda. Islamists leading the jihadist advance in Iraq are using the World Cup and leading British football clubs to seek recruits and spread their propaganda via social media. Tweets sent from the accounts used by the propaganda operation 
of the Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant and its supporters are being labelled with hashtags such as hashtag Brazil 2014, hashtag ENG, hashtag France and hashtag WC2014 to try and hijack the World Cup tournament to spread their message. And then there's a very interesting article and I just like these um, six words, petrodollars, petrified of the Arab Spring. Israeli airstrikes hit Syrian military targets. The Israeli military has carried out airstrikes on targets inside Syria, including a military headquarters, in response to a cross-border attack that left an Israeli teenager dead. In all, Israel said it struck nine military targets inside Syria, and direct hits were confirmed. Targets located near the site of Sunday's violence in the Golan Heights and included a regional military command center and unspecified launching positions. There was no immediate response from Syria. Israeli police identified the boy as Mohammed Karaka, 14, of the Arab village of Araba in northern Israel. Um, and then uh, Netanyahu said in conflicts like Syria, where Al Qaeda inspired extremists are battling Iranian backed Syrian troops, there is no good choice, and it is best for Israel to sit back and let its enemies weaken each other. This is the fault line between civilization and savagery, he said. I'll put up a photograph of the Israeli border with Syria. And then a photograph of Lumumba's capture in Leopold Leopoldville in December 1960. I was listening to a very interesting piece of foreign affairs. If you click on that photograph, you'll find the link. Tusk should throw somebody to the wolves to calm down the situation. This is a sentence in Bloomberg. I think that applies to President Kenyatta as well. The Prime Minister doesn't know where the next blow may be coming from, she said, in such a situation he likes to surprise. Of course, I was in Poland not too long ago and I listened to Premier Tusk and uh, the focus of that, of that speech was all about energy security at the EEC. Um, and then finally, I like this photograph of models wearing creations for Dolce Gabbana men's spring summer 2015 collection. It's quite a lovely photograph. Currency markets, euro, resilient, 136.05. Dollar declined 0.4% last week. Dollar index, 80.28, and at a new low. Uh, 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 it's at uh, the lowest level since May 21st. Japanese yen, 101.94, Swiss e, 0.8948. The pound now solidly above 170 at 170.36. I think it's going to 173.50. Aussie 0.9438 surged 0.5% and that's the strongest level since April 10. India rupee, the problem here is the crude oil price, that's now back above 60 at 60.14. South Korean won 1018.41, the real 2.23. Egyptian pound 7.1465 and the rand firm at 1066.01. China's June HSBC preliminary manufacturing PMI has hit a seven month high above 50 at 50.8 signaling an expansion. Dollar index, I'll put up a three month chart. We couldn't get through that 80, 80, 80, 85 level. We're back now at 80.28 and lowest level since May 21. Euro dollar, put up a three month chart of that. Very resilient. Sterling, I'll put up a five day chart and I think that's now breaking out and going to 173.50. Gold, 13.1206, I'll put up a one-year chart. I think it's overcooked to the top side. Weak dollar, geopolitical uh, pressures all helped it higher. Um, and uh, it touched, uh, touched 1,322 on June 20, which was the highest since April 15. We're now at 13.1206. Uh, it's actually on course for its first back-to-back -back quarterly gain since 2011. Crude oil, 107.17, I think it's going higher still. Um, the volume of all futures traded was 3% above the 100-day moving average. Front month prices are up 8.9% this year. Iraq, where the concerns are now uh, coalescing, pumped 3.3 million barrels a day last month. Um, and it's not likely they're going to manage that again, probably this year. Um, I was responding to an article in Foreign Affairs and uh, a quote from that article which says, as it stands, the mess in Iraq won't dramatically alter the oil market unless things get far worse inside the country. 
And I said, I certainly accept that whilst it's been a breathtaking strike through the Sunni and Kurdish heartland, Baghdad is a whole new ball game, and it is predicted and predictable that Shia resistance in Baghdad will be meaningful. Nevertheless, this new normal, this high-velocity fragmentation informs us that tipping points are a lot closer. And I concluded by saying the super spike risk in the price of oil is higher than at any time in 2014. I'll put up a photograph of the US Geological Survey satellite image showing smoke rising from the Baiji refinery near Tikrit. Frontier Markets 2 photographs show you that I liked the Malifushi by Como opened on the Thar Atoll in the southwest of the Maldives archipelago. And this is a beautiful photograph I found on the Wall Street Journal. And then Tibetans throwing long dark pieces of prayer paper into the air as they celebrate the Wei Sang Festival in Sichuan, China. Both evocative photographs, I thought. Coming to Africa, the South African All Share is up 10.952% and at a fresh record high. Dollar versus Rand, we've seen an improvement there to 1066.20. I think most of the bad news is baked into the Rand actually now. Egyptian pound just below 715 at 714.62. Egyptian stock market down marginally 0.3%. Yesterday, it's up 22.603% this year. This is um, 60-month highs, just off 60-month highs. Nigerian all shares down 0.46375% this year, but remember in the last eight weeks it's had a quite a dramatic improvement. The Ghana stock exchange is up 9.836% this year, but bear in mind we've had some free-falling SEDI which has eroded all those returns. Ghana's government apparently reintroduced fuel subsidies in April without announcing them and have spent around $85 million since then in extra payments. This is the head of the Chamber of Bulk Oil Distributors telling Reuters on Friday. From April 16, they've been doing that massively. The government has spent roughly $85 million in fuel price subsidies in the second quarter, which is not accounted for in the budget, he said. New subsidies are around 13% of the combined total global market price, plus the amount added by government in taxes and levies, he said. Very interesting article in Ventures Africa about inside the continent's new $14 billion social media industry. So a decade ago, most Africans would never have thought that an individual could bring a corporation to its knees in just 140 characters. But in June 2012, Jafet Omujua, an economist by training who has become a prominent Nigerian political advocate and social media personality, went to battle over an iPad lost on a flight with Eric Eyre. Omojua won, like David fighting Goliath, he used a simple and an underestimated tool, launching the Eric Where Is My iPad trend from one of his social media platforms, a Twitter account with over 100,000 followers. Other Eric Air passengers sympathetic to his plight used the same hashtag to narrate their own experiences losing valuables on board Eric Air flights. The resulting social media campaign damaged the airline's reputation and ultimately led the company to suspend its Twitter account. It eventually became popular offline, but it was because it became such a dominant campaign on social media. Then talking about social media, Internet's transformative potential in Africa, 2013 report by McKinsey places the continent's IGDP at $18 billion, um, and saying that, you know, this is laying the foundation for Africa's estimated $14 billion social media industry. And it's a very interesting in-depth piece, uh, and I've pretty much put it up uh, in full on the rich wrap-up. So if you get a chance, do have a look. And we obviously spend a lot of our time um, uh, drilling through uh, social media for some clients of ours and reputation management type issues. And it's extremely fascinating. Part of the issue for me is really the linguistics on that different parts of Africa speak different languages and because of the very young population you know, frequently it's not spoken in correct English there's a lot of slang which makes it tricky coming uh, to Kenya heightened security private security officers perform a search on a vehicle arriving at a pub in Nairobi this is a photograph I found from Agence France Press if you haven't had a chance, do have a look at the 15-minute speech that Dr. Christian Turner made on the occasion of the Queen's birthday um, at his residence. 
um, he called it the lion and the buffalo working together in partnership. And he said this, what concerns me in this are some of the underlying myths which circulated about the advisory change. I would like to tackle three of them head on. The first myth is that Britain wants regime change in Kenya, which was the first government to congratulate the Jubilee administration on winning the 2013 election which was the first government to invite President Uhuru Kenyatta to travel abroad to the London-Somalia conference in May 2013. It was Kenya's oldest partner, the UK. The government of Kenya is democratically elected and will be in power until at least August 2017. The British government is committed to working with it to achieve our shared goals. We are glad to do so in a climate which allows for a strong opposition, space for civil society, a free media, respect for human rights and an end to impunity. Um, then talking about reaching a historic Mau Mau settlement, showing that we are able not only to confront our shared past, but to learn from it and move forward stronger and in a spirit of friendship and reconciliation. The second myth is that there is a competition between East and West in Kenya. I don't agree. This is not the Cold War or the great game of the 19th century. This is a multipolar world where all countries benefit from a rise in foreign investment. I welcome and am excited about China's investment in Kenya. It will bring jobs and infrastructure which will benefit UK interests and UK businesses. The UK and China enjoy a vibrant partnership. There is no binary choice between East and West. Kenya should make investment decisions purely on what is most in Kenya's interests. The third myth is that the UK intends to abandon Kenya to face the threat of terrorism alone. We do not. The terrorist threat is a global one which affects us all. The wounds from Westgate are still raw and the evil events this week in Pecatoni only harden our resolve to stand shoulder to shoulder with Kenyans to tackle this threat. Going forward, we are committed to strengthening Kenya's capacity to counter this shared threat through assistance on investigating prosecuting and detaining terrorists in line with international human rights standards. And uh, very powerful speech, well worth reading, and it slays a lot of myths that are running around social media, and it really demeans some of these uh, myth-makers that they promote such patently absurd myths, I'm afraid. Based on the recent changes in Kenya's security situation, the embassy is also relocating some staff to other countries. This is the State Department said in an updated travel warning for Kenya. I'll put up a photograph I took of Bob Godak 276 days ago when he was talking about looking that the US was looking to build on our 50-year relationship. The US government continues to receive information about potential terrorist threats aimed at US, Western and Kenyan interests in Kenya, including the Nairobi area and the coastal cities of Mombasa and Diani. That's the State Department again. John Githongo tweeted, the arc of death being normalized from Pwani through Garissa, across Wajir, via Mandera to Baringo and down into Bongoma. Uh, I can confirm that 20 people have been killed in the fighting between militia from the Dagodia and Gare. Nine people were also injured. This is in Wajir, which is right up against the border of Somalia. I was reading Thomas Pynchon over the weekend, Vineland, and on page 231 of this book, he speaks of the Uhuru. And you'll have to read the script to see what he is referring to. Um, and uh, I just thought how clairvoyant he can be. And then I put up a photograph of the President's new armoured car, which is an RCV Survivor 1, manufactured in Austria by the company Franz Achleitner. Um, and uh, it's very much a new Uhuru, as described on page 231 of Thomas Pynchon's Vineland. There is a panicky mood because more and more people are realising how dangerous this is. It could turn into an uncontrollable spin. That's the FT. Then uh, from the Taipei Times, it's totally dead, said uh, Ziwa Abdullah Mohammed, who has worked as a tour guide on Lamu since the early 1970s. I'll put up a photograph of the setting sun in Lamu I took 1,367 days ago. Refer you to a quote I found on Reuters of a fellow who points to Swahili graffiti near Lamu's 19th century fort that reads, Boko Haram in Dio Gia, or Boko Haram is the way. And then finally I put up another photograph of Dawn 
from Lamu that I took 1,392 days ago. Um, Subway has stepped up its Kenyan expansion plans, terming its outlets in Nairobi as the best performing in Africa. Um, and then saying, we are just starting to market the brand in Nairobi, yet our average sales per store is already the best in Africa for Subway. Uh, Samantha Luthwaite, who escaped arrest by minutes after her terror conspirator Jermaine Grant warned that the police were nearby with a text message saying the lions are inside. One of them is very watchful, like a bird watches a stone. Habib is already there. Others discussed the meeting, which was described as very important on one message. The Kenya shilling, 87.46. We've bounced off those uh, 2014 lows above 88. The Nairobi All Share up 9.56% this year. The NEC20 down 2.0503%, but up 61 points since the 17th of June when it closed at a 7, September 2013 low and it was, I said, was very oversold. And finally, I'm going to put up a picture of an elephant at sunset that a fellow called Paul Goldstein took. Um, coming back to the markets on Friday, the NEC20 rallied 28 points. Um, I'm saying the net ad from the euro bond will guide interest rates lower and is already being felt at the exchange. Equity markets were previously oversold and I think the rebound is further to run. Williamson T up 1.785% on Friday, P ratio 3.503. Safari come unchanged to 1280, um, but this is the bottom of its trading range and I expect a rebound from here. Kenya Airways rallied 9.545% last week, and that's ahead of an imminent earnings, full year earnings release. KCB well traded, um, uh, and uh, KCB's plus 5.291% in 2014. And I think we'll post fresh all time highs as early as this week. Equity Bank has rallied 44.715% in, in, in 2014. Ticked a little bit lower on some profit taking, but obviously the telecommunication strategy is what's caught everyone's attention. Kengen, which had retreated 32.103% uh, through Friday morning, rallied 5.43% yesterday on Friday and is rallying again. Kennel Kobel has seen a sharp uptick in volumes. No exception on Friday, traded 9.285 million shares. Total Kenya, very strong, up 6.25% on Friday. And I've said it previously, it's a very cheap share, actually. And I think essentially earnings have turned around there. Once again, wishing you a super week. And thank you so much for stopping by.